Good morning and welcome to Highway Christian Fellowship Online. We are so glad to be part of your day today and we trust that the message will be an encouragement to your walk of faith. Highway Christian Fellowship is a family of believers in Christ who simply love God, love others, and seek to serve the world. We are on a journey and we welcome you on this journey to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and to make a difference in our world. If you would like more information about our church, we welcome you to connect with us online at hcfsydney.ca. Or we would love the opportunity to meet with you in person. Our Sunday morning public gatherings take place at 10364 McDonald Park Road in the beautiful seaside town of Sydney, British Columbia. So if you are new to our community, if you are visiting, or you're looking for a new church home, we welcome you to join us at 1030 every Sunday morning. God bless, and we'll see you soon. Especially those who are guests here this morning, we welcome you to Highway Christian Fellowship. I'm Pastor Ralph. You just met Pastor Sue, and uh, we serve here on staff as the pastors at Highway Christian Fellowship. And we hope that you that you are experiencing the presence of the Lord, the love of the saints, and that uh, you will uh, come back again. We would love to have you with us. Um, this is a incredible month. This has been a great month. This is the month that we call Give-tober. And this is the month once a year where we give attention to our missions, both home and abroad. Last week we shared with you how our church is blessing the world through partnerships around the world. Today I'm going to share a little bit about what we are doing and able to do as we partner together with ministries here in Sydney, the peninsula, and across British Columbia. And it's exciting when we think of what God is doing because we are simply partnering with them. I want to thank you for all that you do in giving. And some people would say, oh, pastor, why are you preaching a message on giving on Thanksgiving? Well, I, I, I thought about that. I thought about that. And it, it, it dawned on me, we, we, we are in the season in Israel where the Jews are celebrating some of the major feasts. And this week they're celebrating Rosh Hashanah. And in the Old Testament, Moses uh, God, through Moses, gave a command to Israel to celebrate these feasts and to bring an offering, an offering of thanksgiving, an offering of praise. An offering of worship involves so much more than just our voices. It involves our time, our talent, and yes, our treasure. And so when we come and we give our offering, we're not coming to just put an envelope in a box or we're online, no. We are submitting to the Lord, God, you own it all. You own it all. And I am worshiping you as a token, as, as part of that worship I give to you. So giving is really a va valued part, an essential part, of our worship together. Last week we looked at where generosity begins. Generosity begins in the heart, in the heart. As God changes us, he changes our perspective. And when he changes, changes our perspective, he gives us 
a generous eye. And that's what we want to talk about today. Let's open in prayer. Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for all that you are doing today. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you are going to open our hearts by the Holy Spirit to hear what you have to say through your word to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, listen, I want to talk, tell you about a friend of mine. His name is Tony. Tony came to Canada following the war from Great Britain. And like many first Canadians, he worked, he saved, and made a comfortable life for himself and his family in his adopted home. Now, if you were to ever meet him, Tony had an infectious smile and laugh that brightened the darkest room. He had a way with words that would bring encouragement to the most depressed soul. Tony lived in a modest home in Toronto along with his wife, Audrey, and only son, David. He dressed in regular clothes. He drove only one car for as long as I knew him. For over 30 years, he drove a Volvo. That was it. He was also my Sunday school teacher. In fact, I remember as he taught us, his British accent gene seemed to add authenticity to everything he said, especially when he read from the King James, which, of course, was the only translation we had back then. He served as an elder in our church. Later on, he joined the staff of Agent Court Church as the church's administrator. But there was more to Tony than a rich, deep British accent. There was more to Tony than uh, teaching Sunday school. There was more to Tony than all of these things. He was blessed. I mean, blessed. If I could say this, he was blessed beyond blessed. But when you came to church, and Tony would be the very first person that you would ever me to greet you. You would never know it. I remember on Sunday nights, how many remember Sunday night service? I am that old. I remember on Sunday nights we would have testimony times. People would stand up and gave praise for God's miraculous provision. A couple weeks earlier, they may have stood up to give a prayer request of needing a mortgage paid or a rent paid or their car needed work or they didn't know where the groceries were going to come from. And now two weeks later, they stood up and they were giving praise for immeasurably miraculous provision. What they did not know and what we found out only afterwards when Tony had passed away Tony would stand in the foyer of the church. He would greet people. He would smile with people. He would get to know their names. He, he, he had one of those memories. He, he could remember names and faces and words like no one else I knew. And as he was talking with people, he would hear their voices. He would hear other people be behind them talking about needs. Tony had an incredible ability to be able to pinpoint people and see needs that nobody else knew. And then during that week, he would write a check to the church and ask for anonymously that it would be sent to those individuals or... He would have, buy groceries and have them delivered to a home. Or he would call the bank and say, look, I want to pay so-and-so's mortgage this month. Or he would call, them, call a mechanic and that mechanic would call an individual and say, look, I don't know who this person is, but I want you to know if you would come to my garage this week, your car will be fixed, fully paid. The Lord had blessed Tony. And he believed that his blessing was because of God. And so he honored God by blessing others. You see, Tony had what I call a generous eye. A generous eye. And we find this in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 9. 
And the New King James Version says this, He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Another translation renders it, A bountiful eye will be blessed. Have you ever prayed for a bountiful or a generous eye? I think that is such an awesome phrase. Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed. Any eye that is looking for ways to be generous, that is looking for those in need, looking for help, that's a bountiful, generous eye. Oh, I pray that God would give us all in this church a generous, bountiful eye to see the need that is not only within our church, but outside our church in our community. I pray this for us each and every day. I pray for a bountiful eye for our youth, for every mom and dad, for every grandma and grandpa. I pray for every single person that we would possess a bountiful eye. For whoever has a bountiful, generous eye will be blessed for he shares his bread with the poor. There's a couple attitudes that hinder a bountiful or generous eye. Or to make it even more practical, I went to the ophthalmologist a few weeks ago. And as part of my diabetic regimen, I need to see the doctor once a year. And my eye doctor sent me to a specialist. And I went to the specialist, and the doctor told me two things about my eyes. He said, I have astigmatism, which was no surprise to me. I've had that since I was before high school but he also said I have the beginnings and most of us understand this of cataracts and I said asked him well doc when when will it be cleared up oh he says don't worry when it gets fuzzy enough we'll let you know wasn't that comforting but there are some Christians they've got a spiritual stigmatism They've got, a spirit, they've got spiritual cataracts that cloud their eyes and dull their eyes from seeing what's in front of them. And this, and, and, and this is displayed in two attitudes. One is pride. Pride that says, I've got enough. I've acquired everything I need. I don't need anything else. I don't need anyone. It is all mine. And then there is the attitude of shame that says, yes, I have this, but I don't want anybody to know about it. God wants us to have a generous eye. He doesn't want us, he doesn't want pride to uh, get in the way of how we are going to be blessed and be a blessing. He doesn't want us to be shamed to think that we need to, to hide our blessing. This was my reaction to Gervais that I told you about last week. When Gervais wanted to bless Sue and I with her harvest of beans, pride and shame said, no, I'm, I, I can't accept this. And Sue very rightfully rebuked me of how I was denying her, Javai's, the ability and freedom and blessing of blessing their pastors. God, give us a generous eye. What does a generous eye look like? How do I know I have a generous eye? Or how can I develop a generous eye? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to tell you this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Jesus gave a parable in this chapter describing the two ways that people see God's blessing. And so as you open your Bibles to Matthew 25, we're going to start at verse 14. And we're going to go through each of these verses down to verse 30. And first of all, I want us to see that everything that you have comes from God and belongs to God. 
verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Everything you have comes from God and belongs to God. Notice here that when the master goes away, Jesus said he doesn't entrust the servants with their property, but with his property. Everything you and I have comes from God. Everything you and I have belongs to God. And this is where we begin. God is the owner. We are only his stewards. We are servants of God and stewards of all that he's given us. Our time, our treasure, our talents. All of our treasure, all of our talents, all of our money, all that we, that, that we have that he has blessed us with, our work, our skills, our abilities, our time, everything we have comes from God and belongs to him. And this is the first thing that we need to see if we're going to develop a generous eye. Notice also he gives us according to our abilities. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Notice he didn't give them what they couldn't couldn't, uh, manage. He gives to each according to their abilities. Jesus says that the owner gave different amounts of money to the three servants. The first servant received five talents of gold. The second received three and the third received one. They all received something. God gave them each. The master gave them each something. And likewise, God has given to each and every one of us something. There is no one in this room that can say they are without. No one. Especially when we compare ourselves to those living in Malawi, the children in our uh, 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 our orphanages, compared to many countries in the world the poorest person in this country has everything we have everything from the hand of a loving gracious almighty faithful God which is why we can sing great is thy faithfulness and God gives each according to our abilities there's a reason why not all of us are rich or famous or in positions of power or authority. Why? Because God knows what you and I can handle and what we cannot. Some of us are more limited in our abilities. Some of us can handle much more. But God is sovereign over our lives and the resources and abilities he has given to each of us. Notice thirdly that a generous eye does not waste the opportunities. Verse 16, a man who had re- the man who had received five bags of gold went and at once put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained too much, two more. And the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Let me ask you, what are you doing with what God has given you? In this parable... Jesus says the man who had received five talents put his money to work and gained and doubled it. The one with two talents doubled that. But the one who received one went off, dug a hole, and hid it from his master. What are you doing? You all have something. We all have something. What are we doing with what God has given? Are we putting it to work for God and his kingdom? Are we learning and growing and developing the resources and abilities that God has given? Remember, God owns it all. We're just stewards of what he's given us. So in summary, remember everything we have comes and belongs to God. He gives each of us according to our abilities. 
and he calls us not to waste our talent our our talents I want you to notice a couple things that set these servants apart two of them they all received something from their master two of them multiplied what they had been given one hid their talent what was the difference two were faithful one wasn't the difference of the two was found in their faithfulness the two served in obedience and faith while the one served out of fear and shame notice that God expects you and I to be faithful for what he has given us Verse 19, after a long time, the master who's of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. You and I, with everything that we have been given, are responsible for the resources and abilities to God. We are responsible to use those resources and abilities and talents that God has given for his glory and his kingdom because when, the, when Christ returns, it will be time to settle accounts. And if we have misused anything, well, we risk losing it all. The first two servants were both faithful with what God had given them, and God commended them for it. And that's the first thing that we learn from, from this parable, that God sees and God expects you and I to be faithful for what he has given. And notice the second thing, the more God gives, the greater responsibility. I've often had people ask me, Pastor, what do you think heaven is going to be like? Do you think we're going to finally get to rest from all of our work? I got news for you. Nope. <laughs> In fact, the more we've served and we've blessed others and we've given to his kingdom, we're going to be given even more responsibility for eternity. It's not, heaven's not going to be a place where we just sit on a cloud playing on our keyboards and violins and guitars and just wait out eternity. No, there's going to be so much for us to do. The more God gives, the greater your responsibility. Look at verse 20. The man who had received five talents of gold, five bags of gold, brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Oh, I, I just want you to underline that if you can this morning. We will share the father's happiness. Isn't that awesome to think about? Wow. And what is he thankful for? What is God happy for? Guess what? You and me. And as we are faithful to him, man, God's proud of you. Think about that. I've often heard it said growing up, you know, we may have heard the illustration, you know, if God had a refrigerator, our picture would be on it. When our kids, when our grandkids were visiting earlier this summer, Chloe, as precocious as she can be and inquisitive, found a box in a closet she was not supposed to be in. And in that box were mementos of her aunt, her uncle Mike, and her dad. And there were things in that box included were newspaper clippings that Sue and I had kept of Phil when he was in the provincial track and field meets. I am not sure, I imagine, but for many years, Phil's record had not been beaten in the Eastern Ontario Athletic Association. And she asked, Papa, why are you keeping all of these old stuff? I just looked at her and said, oh, honey, because your 
daddy's my son, and I love him, and your uncle, and your aunt, and these remind me of how proud I am. And I want us to know this morning that maybe what you have in the world standards doesn't seem like much. But when we put it to work, when we invest in his kingdom, when we are serving with everything that we have, with what God has given us, and when we see that fruitfulness, I want us to know something. God is in heaven, and our Father says, Way to go, George. You're leading that Wednesday night group. You could have just sat back, but no, you saw a need. Way to go, George. He's looking and he's seeing Lily and Erwin in that home ministering to all of the, the staff there. And he says, way to go, guys. I'm proud of you. He hears your prayers. He, hear, he sees your faithfulness. He takes note of your service. And he says, you are my son and daughter, and I'm proud of you. Don't give up. The, two, the servants were given five and two talents each, and they put them to work. Why? Because they weren't looking to see what they could earn. They weren't looking to see what they, how they could benefit. They were looking to see how they were going to honor and glorify their master. And when we give, when we serve, when we, we honor God, and we're saying, God, this is for you. Finally, in this, the section, finally, this section of the parable teaches us that when you're faithful with little, you'll be entrusted with more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. Let me ask you another question. I asked earlier, what are you doing with what God's given you? Let me ask you a second question. Do you want God to entrust you with more in this life and the next? Well, then the answer is simple. Be faithful with what you've got. If you're not being faithful with the resources and abilities God has already given you, why would you expect God to give you any more? And so this next section teaches us that the good and faithful servant gains more for the master. God expects you to be faithful for what he gives you, and the more God gives you, the greater your responsibility. And when you are faithful with little, you will be entrusted with more. Well, those were two servants. There was one more. And what happens to him is rather sobering. This third servant did not serve from a position of faith, but of fear. He did not have a generous eye. You could say he possessed a spiritual stigmatism. A stigmatism occurs when, when the cornea lens or eye has an irregular shape, preventing light from entering the eye correctly, causing blurred vision. And that's what I've had since I've been in high school. That's why when I got my glasses ever since then, I have to get them thinned out or they would be as thick as, as Coke bottles. What does spiritual stigmatism do? Spiritual stigmatism distorts our view of God. Look at verse 24. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. Those are some of the most sobering words that any follower of Jesus can tell, express about God. What on earth could he possibly be afraid of? But he says, I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Now notice, he recognized that the gift was from God. 
or from his master. He recognized it wasn't his, but his master's. He also recognized that he had a responsibility and was accountable to his master for what would happen to it. So why on earth would he be afraid? And the answer is given in verse 26. Or rather, he says, I was afraid and went out and hid your gold. See here what belongs to you. He says, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. I don't know why, but this man felt, in his view, God was someone not to be revered, but someone to be feared. His two contemporaries revered and so worshipped and followed and obeyed their master, wanting to please their master. This servant had a fear and was afraid. What if I can't do it? What if I can't be obedient? What if I can't be successful? What if I lose it? What if I'm robbed? And he allows fear to dictate his decision. Verse 26, his master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have at least put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Which begs the question, why didn't he simply do that? That would have been the simplest thing to do. But he hides it in the ground. Why? I think for the same reason many of us hide our talents in the ground. Because we're afraid we're going to fail. We're afraid we're going to lose it. We're afraid what others are going to say. We're afraid of what others are going to do. We're more afraid of others than we are of revering a God who loves us, who provides for us, who does everything in his power to, to, to help us succeed in our lives. And when we allow fear to dictate our faith, we end up losing it all. You see, spiritual stigmatism fails to see not only will you not receive a reward, you will lose all that God initially gave you. Verse 28, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Time will not permit me right now to delve into all of the uh, pertinent truth and sobering truth in here. Suffice it to say, God has given you it all. He has entrusted you with all that you have. We have a choice to be faithful and invest in his kingdom with our time, our talents, our treasure, to take those opportunities to serve, to glorify God because we love him, or allow fear to dictate how we are going to serve. And when we do, we end up losing it all. The point of the parable is not the size of the talent and treasure, but it's how we are investing it for the kingdom and God's glory. Oh Lord, God give us, give us a generous eye to see the blessings you, you, that you have given and how they will help others and glorify your name. Why has God blessed you? As I look around this congregation, every single person in this room is blessed. Know it. Believe it. You are blessed. Why? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. You will be made rich in every way. As we said last week, this will include relationally, spiritually, in our marriage, in our jobs, and yes, even financially. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be what? Generous on every occasion, both the good times 
and the bad, the convenient and the inconvenient. You know what really blew me away about, about my, my friend Tony was that I remember there was a time in the 80s our nation went through a deep, dark recession. It impacted his business incredibly. He lost almost everything he had ever worked for, but the one thing he never stopped doing was giving unto the Lord. He may not have been able to give what he had previously done, but he kept doing it because he knew everything he had was from God. And whether good times or bad, we give and serve the Lord to his glory. And that, he says, through us, your generosity will result. How? In thanksgiving to God. You want to know why we preach on finances on Thanksgiving? Here it is. We, it'll result in us giving thanks and praise to God because it's all about his glory. Can you say amen? So what do you see this morning? What has God blessed you with? Your time, your talent, your treasure. Do you have a bountiful eye? When we live with a bountiful eye and a generous heart, we give because God has blessed us with more, so I will intentionally give more. Next Sunday, Pastor Sue is going to conclude our Blessed Life series with a message sharing how we are partnering here in our church to bless our community. In two weeks, Ken Russell will be our guest speaker. He'll dedicate our renovated family ministry center and following that, we're going to enjoy a blessed lunch together. But what we also wish to do is we want to cap off this Givetober month with a missions offering. And there are two projects which we will be presenting to you. One is our annual Christmas hampers. And secondly, we would like to bless our school lunch programs in our schools here in Sydney. So right now, begin to pray, God, you, this is what you've given me. How can I bless your work? Last week I shared about our global workers. Let me just take a couple minutes to share about who we are partnering with locally. Because of a generous eye, we have teamed up with Tim Schindel and Leading Influence they are raising up chaplains across Canada who serve our members of parliament and provincial MLAs and MNAs, offering comfort, counsel, encouragement, and prayer to, uh, to our elected parliamentarians and their staff. And I really pray that you are able to be here Thursday night at 7 o'clock as we gather for the good and pray for our election. Pray for our elected leaders. We will have worship. We will share together. Um, uh, we will have one of the chaplains from, from our, our, our legislature here with us to share on Thursday night. So I trust and pray and, and implore you and invite you to come Thursday night as we pray for our province. Because of a generous eye, we partner with the Haven Pregnancy Support Clinic in Victoria, led by Gina McKay and her team. They empower women. They have created a safe place supporting women in helping make decisions that are consistent with biblical values. We are, they're helping women and creating options for these women. With a generous eye, we are giving to the, we are partnering with the Sandwich and Lions Food Bank. With a generous eye, we support and support Bev Elder and in her efforts to help those who are without. Let me just share a few stats with you this morning. These are very recent stats. Did you know in British Columbia, food bank visits have increased 57% since 2019? 30 percent of all food bank users in BC are children. Let that sink in for a second. The number of seniors ac assessing uh, food banks has increased 20 percent in the last two years since the end of COVID. 
Donations to food banks have dropped 30% across the province. In the back, we have a bucket that when you are able, you can donate and drop some foods into that bucket as we help support the food bank. God, give us a generous eye to help the children, parents, and grandparents of Sydney and the peninsula as they struggle just to put food on the table. And finally, God has given us a generous eye to see the needs of our First Nations neighbors. With a generous eye, we have come alongside in the last 24 years to assist, to partner with Rick Wismer and the Big Blue Bus. Since 2000, our church has partnered with Rick as they impact the First Nations children and youth in the Peninsula, Victoria, and Cowichan Valleys. Pray for Rick. Pray for Rick right now especially as they are looking at how they are going to meet the great need that is before them. They've had some doors close. They've had some of the First Nations say, we don't want the Bible here. Come with your bus, but don't tell us about Jesus. Rick is looking for people to come alongside and pray to help, to serve. And I hear some of people say, Pastor, that's a lot of partners that we are supporting. Shouldn't we be keeping our money here at home? My friend, with all of the love and respect I have, that's a, that's a spiritual stigmatism I. I'll be honest, in the natural, it doesn't make sense for us. We are not a huge congregation. God has only given us so much. But God has given us a spiritual eye, a generous eye, a bountiful eye to see the need. And with what God has given us, we will, we will invest to see that children are fed, that families are cared for, that, that First Nations receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, that even our politicians are prayed for, that young women who are in desperate need receive the help that they can. That is why we give. That is why we partner. That is why we invite you today to join us in this Giftober month to be part of what God is doing in Sydney, in Victoria, in this island, and across the world. And so I'm inviting you today to partner in two ways. Number one, First and foremost is to pray. We've provided these prayer booklets. You can pick one up in the foyer. And uh, it lists there all of our local and global um, partners that we support. I encourage you to pick this up and pray for each and every one of these families and the nations that they serve. And of course, the second way that we support that we do is to give. We have four opportunities to give. Number one, when you came in, there was the offering box. Fill out an envelope, put it in there. If you would like to give to missions, just put that on the line, mission. There's a line there you can put missions and the amount you would like to go to missions. You can give through e-transferring at giving at hcfsydney.ca or online through our website. We also have a debit machine through these doors. And to your right in the office, there is a debit machine there where you can also give securely and safely. I'm inviting the worship team to come up right now. And thirdly, the best way that we can give is to worship. Is to worship. So what I'd like us to do is we're going to stand and we're going to worship. And as we do, I'm going to challenge you today. God, this is what I have. I give to you. That's it. That's it. Let's stand together and let's worship him. We trust that today's message has been an encouragement to you. 
If you prayed at the end of the message and you would like more information about what it means to be a follower of Christ, we invite you to connect with us at hcfsydney.ca and a pastor would be pleased to connect with you and share with you material how you can grow strong in your faith. If you would like to contribute to the ministry of Highway Christian Fellowship, you can do so online through our website, again at hcfsydney.ca. God bless. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you.